Good morning. Morning. And it's good to be back. For those who don't know, I was in Lakeport, California last week doing a, a seminar out at Lakeport. I was say hi to our new friends in Lakeport. We had a really uh, good time out there. And I'm going to do something very dangerous right now. I'm going to actually say hi to some specific people. And it's dangerous because now I might forget somebody I shouldn't forget. So if I didn't say hi, then don't get your feelings hurt. But I want to re- say hi to Randy and Karen, um, who Randy, Pastor Randy and his wife, Karen. And... Um, Dave and Vonnie, maybe you guys remember Dave and Vonnie Lounsbury. They used to be a member of this class, and they lived here in College Dale, and then they moved to California some years ago. They were there. And um, Carol and George, say hi to you guys. And then Dan and um, Rudy, say hi to you guys. Because Dan and Rudy, they're kind of, well, I ho- hope it don't upset you, but they're kind of groupies to our class. <laughs> um, they've been to more than 10 of my programs out in California. When I go out there, they kind of come around and come to the programs, and we really appreciate all of you. Let's begin class with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truth of your character of love, your methods, the way you run your universe. We ask that your spirit will join us, enlighten our minds, help us to um, join the fellowship of love that the rest of the universe operates in. We pray in your holy name. Amen. We are doing lesson number six in the quarterly, uh, the Gospel in Galatians, and the title is The Priority of the Promise. The Priority of the Promise. What does the title mean? The Priority of the Promise. It implies the importance of the promise to Abraham being better than the laws given later. So the promise takes precedence, and salvation comes from the promise, not from the law. Does that make sense to everyone? The memory text is Galatians 3.18. It says, For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by the promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. What was the promise? Now, think carefully. Was the promise given first to Abraham? No. No. Where was the promise first given? Eden. To Adam and Eve. What was the promise? The promise is the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. That's the promise, right? Mm -hmm. And then that promise was then given to Abraham... It was given to all humanity, and then to Abraham through your family, the promise that I previously given, through your family, the promise will come. It was the promise that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Now it's the promise of the seed. And so here it is in um, Galatians 3.16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. The scripture does not say to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. And that's the same promise that was given and referred to in Eden. Now, the promise, if you read in Genesis, Genesis 12, 7, 13, 15, and 24, 7, the promise was given three times, the promise of the seed. But what was the promise stated to Abraham? That this land would be his forever through the seed that would give him the land. Was that land being referred to a little tiny strip of acreage off of the Mediterranean there in the Middle East? Is that, is that the promise of the seed is going gonna, is gonna to reclaim a few acres of land on planet Earth? The rest of it's going to stay Satan's. But that little strip of land will be for, for Abraham and, 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 and all those who are under the inheritance and the promises given to Abraham. Or was the promise that the seed was going to reclaim the entire planet? What do you think? All nations would come. That's right. Who's included under the promises? All those who have faith like Abraham are considered children of Abraham. So is the promise that the land would be Abraham's and his, his descendants forever simply a promise for that little strip of acreage, which is still what I think nine out of ten Christians think? When they, certainly the Jews today think that. In America, why we're so pro-Israeli is because they look to these promises and they think that little strip of land is going to be theirs forever, and so we have to support it. But what did Jesus say? The meek shall inherit the... Pal- Palestinian lands. The Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip. No, it doesn't say that. The meek shall inherit the earth. The entire earth. What's it say in Romans chapter 8? Nature in Palestine groans under the weight of sin. Does the law have absolutely no value then? Did God do away with the law? Thoughts about that? Which law? Which law? 
Okay, which law, that's, law that's, lens. pardon? Which law lends? Yeah, yeah, no, and which, which law lends that we look through the question through? And which law, that's a great question. In Galatians, this has been argued throughout Christianity, was uh, Galatians, the law was added. Galatians 3, the law was added. Is it referring to the ceremonial, the moral law? This is argued back and forth of different groups. Any thoughts on that? Both. Both, thank you. That is exactly the position of the quarterly. It's the position that I take. It's the position that Ellen White took. It's the position that the official position of our, of our church is that both laws are represented in Galatians is being added. Um, the lesson is correct. I want you to point this out. The lesson is correct. Working to keep the law cannot save us. Getting the right rituals, worshiping on the right day, getting the right circumcision, taking communion in the right way, getting baptized in the right way. All these works have no power to save. If they could save, there'd be no need for Christ. We could just do those ceremonies and be saved. Everybody see that? Okay. Why can they not save? Here's why they cannot save. Keeping the law cannot save. Because the problem is not a legal one. Our problem is not a legal problem. Our problem is a condition of being problem. The teachings with legal solutions for the sin problem make an obstruction in people's minds from partaking of the real remedy. It's kind of like, and I think this is a good metaphor, snake oil. Remember the old days snake oil? Uh, they'd go around and, and they would sn sell the stuff that was supposed to be this remedy that was going to cure all your ails and illnesses. And they ended up calling it snake oil. Okay, so, you know, we got the, the serpent in Eden is the, the originator of snake oil. And this, this legal remedy is the same type thing. People rest secure claiming the legal solution for their sin problem. My records have been purged. My, my debt has been paid. A pardon has been stamped against my name. But there's no change in the heart. It's just legal, legal accounting mechanisms. And as long as I, if I commit sin, because I'm going to keep committing, there's no victory over sin, you know, in the legal world. There's just legal accounting for the sin. And when you commit sin, you just have to repent. And when you do, the blood of Jesus covers. And in some views, all sins, past, present, and future, even the ones you haven't committed yet, they were all placed on Christ and punished in Christ. And when you accept him, that accepts the payment for all future ones. You don't have to worry about repenting really anymore because you've already done it. Because once you're saved, you're always saved. You can't be lost. See, this legal mechanism obstructs people from actually he experiencing the freedom and regeneration that God wants to give them. What we teach is that sin is an actual deviation from God's design protocols for life. And we, through participating with Christ, are either restored in heart and mind to be in harmony with God and his design or not. That's it. We have a new heart and right spirit. We're regenerating the inner man. We get the mind of Christ. The law is written on the heart and mind. Um, we have circumstances of the heart. The heart of stone is removed. The heart of flesh is put in. All the metaphors are talking something changing inside of us. That's what the Bible is trying to teach. Either you have participated in that and been changed, or you haven't. It's like people, we all have an infection of some kind, and it's terminal, and we have an antibiotic that cures. We either take the antibiotic or we haven't. So then what do we do with all the legal language? Such as God pardoning the sinner. What do you do? That, that language sounds very... And there's quotes like that. And there's references like that. And people say, see, that's legal language, so it must be a legal problem. Well, let's look at this quote and consider this. This is out of Christ Triumph on page 139. Satan deceives many people with the plausible theory that since God's love for his people is so great, he will excuse sin in them. That while the threatenings of God's word are to serve a, a certain purpose in his moral government, they are never to be literally fulfilled. Pause. Did you hear what that just said? God's really good. God's really loving. And because he's so loving and good, even though he threatens like a parent who may threaten sometimes a child who's running to the street, he will never carry out those threats. <laughs> Right. Okay. This is what this is saying. It's a, that that Satan, Satan deceives many people with the plausible theory that since God's love for his people is so great, he will excuse sin in them. That while the threatenings of God's word are severe, uh, are to serve a certain purpose in his moral government, they are never to be literally fulfilled. What is the underlying basis for this lie? This is a lie built on a previous lie. 
She doesn't expose here the previous lie. But this lie only works if you've accepted a previous lie. What's the previous lie you have to accept in order for people to actually believe the lie that God would never, you know, that he would excuse sin? And the language that she uses is very careful, that he would excuse sin. God is the source of the punishment. Okay, but that, that is a lie, that God's source of punishment, and that lie is predicated on another lie. The same lie that Eve believed. God's not trustworthy. Which is predicated on, which way does God's law work, guys? Mm-hmm. Always back to that question. You see, if the law is arbitrary, like what happens in this courtroom, when somebody speeds and they get a ticket from the officer for doing 50 in a 35 zone, and they come in here to this court, the judge can say, I I pardon it. And there's no consequence. It's just pardoned. Because there is no inherent consequence to doing 50 in a 35 zone. Nothing inherently goes wrong. You have to be pulled over by some authority and you have to be punished. Some, some punishment must be inflicted upon you. There is no inherent punishment for doing that. And thus it can be pardoned. So this idea, this idea that Satan deceives many with the plausible theory that since God's lo- love is so, uh, to, for his people so great, he will excuse sin. Notice she doesn't say he will not, he will not punish it. He will excuse it. It's based on this idea that he could. He can't. It'd be like a doctor having a patient that he's warned not to smoke. Don't smoke. Don't smoke. And they smoke two packs a day. And they now have emphysema. The doctor will not excuse that. They can't, you can't excuse it. There's no excuse. I can't excuse that. I, 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 you get bit by a rattlesnake. You end up in the ER. Doctor, please save me. You are pardoned. I pardon you. You are forgiven. You're excused. And that's not what you want. There's no excuse. You have to have a remedy. You have to heal it. See, this is the difference between imposed law, which has no inherent consequence that, you, that works like human laws that you then have to punish people for, or God is the creator, the builder of space, time, and reality, and his laws are how reality actually function. You break those, it always injures you. You can't get away with it. So God never excuses sin, but every person who refuses remedy will reap a terribly painful end, but not at the hands of God. It would be like saying those with a terminal illness who refuse cure, God will excuse. No, he won't. He won't excuse it. But he doesn't inflict punishment on them either. But they are, but they do suffer. All right, and keep on with the quote. But in his dealings with his creatures, God has maintained the principles of righteousness by revealing sin in its true nature, by demonstrating that it's Sure, result is misery and death. What, what was, she just went, went and described what? It's your, sin's sure result is misery and death. Not the punishment of God inflicted upon those who breaks his rule is torture and death. No, that's how it's taught under the imposed law model. Breaking design law, tying a plastic bag over your head results in suffocation and death. It's not an infliction. And it's the principles of righteousness that was here, not the rules. The unconditional, here we get to the pardon language, the unconditional pardon of sin never has been and never will be. Such pardon would show the abandonment of the principles of righteousness that are the very foundation of the government of God. Amen. The unconditional, it's like the unconditional pardon of, think of all the violations of the laws of health. There is no unconditional pardon of that. There's only conditional. What's the conditional? Healing. You have to be put. Doctors don't heal patients outside the laws of health. Doctors are always working to put people back in harmony with the laws of health. That's how life works. So there is a condition to your health that you live in harmony with the laws of health, that you are operating in harmony with the laws of health. Wherever you're out of harmony, there's some health problem going on there. Okay? That's a condition. What's the one fair? Those in the opposed law camp, though, will use quotes like this about the pardon, that there's no unconditional pardon of sin, and they will apply it to the condition being a legal payment being made because it's pardon language. They miss the entire description of reality that's even in here. It's like blind leading the blind. They read it, and they'll use quotes like this because they have the wrong law lens. So what is the cause of the misery and quote, even in that uh, misery and death, even in that quote? It, it's, it's sin itself. That's the cause. Okay. So would you be comfortable then saying, and I'm going to test you, so think carefully here. Would you be comfortable saying that pardon and healing are the same? 
that pardon and setting a person right or putting them back in harmony with God's design are one and the same. Another way for setting, another word for setting someone right or putting them right is justification. So would you comfortable saying that pardon and justification are the same, one and the same? Well, here's a quote out of Faith and Works. And for those who don't know, the author is Ellen White who wrote this. And so you see if you agree with her opinion or not. Pardon and justification are one and the same thing. <laughs> broken record in here. Through faith, the believer passes. Now, now, think through because this language, this language is used. And quotes like this are used by the legal camp. Pardon and justification. Therefore, pardon is a legal thing. Justification is a legal thing. That's what they'll say. And notice some of the description here. Through faith, the believer passes from the position of a rebel, a child of sin and Satan, to the position of a loyal subject of Christ Jesus, not because of any inherent goodness, but because Christ receives him, receives him as his child by adoption. The sinner receives the forgiveness of his sins because these sins are borne by his substitute and surety. The Lord speaks to the Heavenly Father, saying, This is my child. I reprieve him from the condemnation of death, given him, uh, giving him my life insurance policy, eternal life, because I have taken his place and have suffered for this, his sins. He is even my beloved son. Thus man, pardoned and clothed with the beautiful garments of Christ's righteousness, stands faultless before God. How do you hear it? This is classic stuff used by the penal camp, but it's not penal at all. But if you have that lens on, I was uh, a few weeks ago talking with um, some people from um, a Methodist background, good, good, loving, hearted people, but they have premises, premises about the nature of man. And if you have certain premises before you go to the scripture, then it influences how you read the scripture. One of the premises they, they hold is that God in Eden when he created Adam and Eve, before they sinned, endowed them with immortality. Some part of their being, soul, spirit, whichever one they, they choose, can never die. It's immortal. That's a, that's a premise. It's an assumption. And because you hold that premise, then when you read certain portions of Scripture, you draw different conclusions than if you read that man was, had conditional immortality. As long as they remained loyal, they had access to the tree of life. But if they didn't, then they're mortal. They can die. It's a completely different way to read the scripture. The premise one holds. If you have a legal premise, if you actually believe God's law works no differently than the laws that sinners can make, and just think what it says about God, that, that he can't make laws better than ours, functionally better than ours. Yes? If you read what she said through a love lens as Christ talking to his father about something, can you take that differently? Yes, of course. Uh, it's, it's God was in the Son reconciling the world to himself. They have different roles in this plan. And this is just them communicating with each other. Okay? Um, but I was thinking particularly about this part. The, uh, through faith, the believer passes from the position of a rebel, a child of sin and Satan, to the position of the loyal subject of, of Jesus Christ. Is what's actually happening, what's, what's being transferred, is that actually a legal process that's happening or a state of being change that's happening? What makes someone a rebel? A legal status or an actual state of sinfulness, a hardening of the heart, an enmity in the heart to God? What makes a rebel? I didn't hear you. A state of being in the heart, a heart that's against God, the heart's operating on the principles of selfishness rather than the principles. We're rebels by the nature of the heart, not by a legal status. So then, if we're changed from rebels to loyal sons and daughters of God, is that a legal status change or is that a change of the nature of the heart? That's being reborn. That's being renewed. That's dying to the old person and rising to the new. The old is dead. The new has come. That's regeneration. That's transformation. So this idea is not legal at all that she's describing here. But if you have a legal lens, you don't even see the reality unless you're cheated. And so many good Christian folks are trapped in a form of godliness that has no power because they're trapped in a legal system and they crave legal solutions and they're not even anticipating in a dwelling spirit to transform and renew. Third paragraph says, Paul's argument, or yeah, third paragraph, no, second paragraph. Paul's argument in Romans 3 parallels his discussion about faith and the law in Galatians. Sensing that his comments might lead some to conclude that he is exalting faith at the expense of the law, uh, Paul asks the rhetorical question, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? The word translated overthrow in Romans 3.31 is uh, kartegio, 
kartigio, uh, Paul uses the word frequ- frequently, and it can be translated as to nullify, to abolish, to be brought to nothing, or even to destroy. Clearly, if Paul wanted to endorse the idea that the law was somehow done away with at the cross, as some people today claim he taught, this would have been the time. But Paul not only denies that sentiment with an emphatic no, he actually states that his gospel establishes the law. Why is this even a concern? Why is this question, was the law done away with, even a concern? Why? There's an underlying premise. I just talked about premises and lenses that you wear. There's an underlying premise that his audience had that many Christians are still struggling with. What's the underlying premise? God's law is imposed on humanity. Thank you that God's law is imposed. And thus Paul's having to educate them on this. This is the same trouble um, that we have today. Um, Think about this. When a doctor provides remedy to a patient with disease, let's say a patient has been and, and doing misconduct. They've been using IV drugs, sharing dirty needles, and using IV drugs with dirty needles, they've got infection, endocarditis, infection inside their heart. And the doctor comes and gives them antibiotic to treat the infection, heals the person, does, and, they're, and they're well. Has, has, has healing the person just done away with the laws of health? Now that you've had the antibiotic, laws of health no longer apply to you. We're, they're, they're gone. We wipe the laws of health out. Do you see how silly that is? That's design law thinking. It's ridiculous. You don't have to make the argument when you understand design law and what the problem is. The reason he has to make the argument is because they think the problem is a legal problem. And if grace comes and pardon comes, it's like in this courtroom. Well, he pardons everybody who speeds. Well, I guess the law of speeding has been done away with because we pardon everybody. In that case, it might be because that law is arbitrary. It's just made up. But the laws of health, God's design laws for reality, are not arbitrary. And thus, they're not done away with. They're established. How, just like treating the person with the endocarditis establishes the laws of health by giving them the remedy that restores them to harmony with the laws of health. This is the only way to reasonably understand this, in my view. Does anybody think of a way that's better to understand this? Sometimes when they're malignant, you can't even cure it because they're gone. They're so far gone. And, and that would be true for our human limited li- limitations in treatment, but God has a remedy that actually treats perfectly for those who let him. So in our particular condition, then the, the, the malignancy would be a malignancy of the faculties that are sensitive to truth and love. If you destroy within yourself those faculties that are capable of recognizing truth, are capable of responding to love, then your condition is terminal without remedy because there, there's no truth that you'll react. There's no love having the impact on you. You've destroyed the avenues through which the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth and Love works. Okay? So that would be a good analogy to that. That's right. Third paragraph, which is not from an inspired source, I want to point out, but are Bible scholars making commentary. Um, and this is what they say. Um... The plan of justification by faith reveals God's regard for his law in demanding and providing the atoning sacrifice. If justification by faith abolishes law, then there is no need for the atoning death of Christ to release the sinner from his sins and thus restore him to peace with God. Was that clear to everybody? Because I, I want you to start thinking, how, how can you rephrase it? How can you can take elements of that and, and, and understand them in a healthy way? I'll read it again from their language. This is what the commentary says. The plan of justification by faith reveals God's regard for his law and, in demanding and providing an atoning sacrifice. If justification by faith abolishes the law, then there was no need for the atoning death of Christ to release the sinner from his sins and thus restore him to peace with God. Sounds very legal to me. But... God is bound by his law to do something. Yes, but let's, let's, let's translate some of these legal words into the reality to which they actually mean in real life. So justification really means what? Setting right or putting right. And what's wrong that needs to be put right? The hearts, minds of sinners, okay? So, and then what is faith? We just talked about what faith is. What's faith? Trust. Trust, our understanding trust with God. Yes, that's right. What is law? in the right way, understood. Design parameters, design protocols, that's law. And then what is atoning? What's the the healthy, mature way of understanding atoning? What's that? 
Healing of at, relationship. at, yes, okay, healing relationship. I like that. Okay, now that's right. At one minute. That's what it means. Bringing, th- bringing uh, parties who are, are, are uh, apart back into oneness, at one. You remember the old King James Bible translated at one, a tone? In 1611, there was a verb. O-N-E. We have a noun, O-N-E. It's the number one. But there was a verb in 1611 called, spelled the same way, O-N-E. And so if two people were at odds, they're arguing, and your friend, you say, hey, I'm going to go one them. It was an action word. I'm going to bring them into one. It very quickly became, I'm not going to go one them. I'm going to go at one them. Spelled A-T-O-N-E. But it's pronounced with the Old English, just like when you're all by yourself, you're not all one, you're alone. We go and atone. Okay? We bring into unity. So atonement is exactly what you say, relationship, unity. So with all that in mind, we could rewrite the commentary to read like this. <clears throat> the plan of restoring people to God's perfection by trust reveals God's regard for his design for life. And, that, and as this could be accomplished only by providing the reuniting and healing sacrifice. If, res- if restoring people to God's perfection by trust abolishes God's design for life, then there was no need for the reuniting and healing death of Christ to heal the sinner from his terminal condition and thus restore him to peace with God. Doesn't that make more sense? And that's what they were saying, but they use this language. And, and I'm going to tell you, they use the language because they don't want to come out and actually say what, what it means to them. What it means to them is, you're under a judicial death um, a uh, condemnation of death sentence. You're under a judicial death sentence. God has got you in death row in the universal prison. And if you don't get the legal payment applied to your account in heaven, then God will execute and kill you. That's what they don't want to come out and say because it's horrible. And so they hide it in this kind of language. Tuesday's light lesson entitled The Purpose of the Law. And we already established what law is being referred to in Galatians 3, and you guys have already said um, both laws, and this is where the, the quarterly says this, first paragraph says, well, both the ceremonial moral laws were added at Sinai because of transgression. We see by considering the following question that Paul appears to have the moral law primarily in mind. And the question is, to what was it added and why? To what was the law added and why? First, do you all agree that the law was added? Yes. Including the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were added. Do you, are, you, are you actually trying to tell me there was a time in universal history where the Ten Commandments did not exist? Yes, that's right. Do you know the people level four and below will have real issue with you now? They think the Ten Commandments are eternal. The Ten Commandments are added. What evidence could you cite that there was a time when the Ten Commandments did not exist? What evidence would you cite? Creation. How does creation tell us that the Ten Commandments did not exist? Prior to the day, prior to the week, how could there be a timing of the Sabbath? Okay, so the Sabbath is measured by sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, which is this earth in relation to that sun, which didn't exist till day four of creation of this planet. So one piece of evidence would be the Sabbath itself. In fact, the Sabbath was not in existence until creation of this planet. Pardon? Okay, honor father and mother. As far as we know, were there any fathers and mothers amongst the angels? How about sins passing down three and four generations? Do the angels have that problem? That's in the commandment, isn't it? How about thou shalt not commit adultery? Did the angels have that problem? Do you see, these ten were specifically written for a species in a certain condition at a certain point in history, in time. Okay? They didn't exist in this form. But they asked the question, what about the principles that the Ten Commandments are based upon? Yes, they are eternal. And what are the principles that the Ten Commandments are based upon? Design. Pardon? Design. Design law, that's right. Design, which are the design principles of love, Truth and freedom. These are the big three. Love, truth, freedom. These are the design protocols. And all law hangs on love for God and love for your man. Yes, yeah, fellow man. So the preface which we often leave out of it, I am your God. You know, that, he starts with that. Mm-hmm. 
Right. And so do we hear the Ten Commandments as an obeying thing or what you're saying as a description of what you'll look like? So back in the day, some of you may not know this, when I went to med school in Memphis, they had a hospital that back in the early part of last century was a tuberculosis hospital. And they still had this giant seal in the, in the lobby in the floor from the tuberculosis hospital. And then if you had tuberculosis in the day, they put you in the hospital, quarantined you because they didn't have a cure and they were separating you from spreading it through the community, right? Now, if they had on the wall, when you leave the hospital, you cannot leave, um, uh, uh, when you leave, only those who leave, they shall not cough, they shall not spit up blood, they shall not have fever, they shall not have nausea and vomiting, and they have all these thou shalt nots that you will do for those, and if you have all those, you're still quarantined in the hospital. But if, if you take the remedy and the cure and you get well, then you, and this is what the commandments are. It, when you accept my remedy, it's no longer you, sinful, enmity, self-centered, fear-based person. It's me, my son, with a new heart and right spirit that loves God and others more than self. And therefore, you will not have any other gods before me. You will not take my name in vain. You won't make images. You will keep the Sabbath holy. You won't, um, uh, you will honor your parents. You won't commit murder and all these things. You won't do those things that you, because those are part of the infection. And so, this is getting back to why then the law. The law is like a guideline for the promise. Three, what are the reasons for the law? Three, three reasons. One, a diagnostic instrument like an MRI. It diagnoses, it reveals what's wrong. We're going to get unpack this, but I'll give you the three right now. Diagnostic instrument, MRI. Remember the law is not given for the righteous, but for the wicked. It's not given for, MRIs were not designed for healthy people. Were they? They were designed to find pathology, to find something that's wrong. That's what they're designed for, to diagnose. Does the MRI cure people, though? No. That's like trying to get well with the law. The MRI, ha- the Ten Commandments have no ability to get people well. They have only the ability to diagnose what's wrong. But there's another reason for the law. Quarantine. Talks about this. Quarantined by the law. A hedge of protection. Hems isn't. We haven't had a change of heart yet, but we don't commit adultery because the rule says not to do it. I'd like to, I'd really like to, but I won't because the rule says not to. Well, I'm quarantined, I'm protected. I'm protected from getting diseases. I'm protected from from having all kinds of social problems. I'm protected from searing and warping my character and conscience further. Okay, lots of protections come from obeying the law, even though my heart isn't changed. Quarantined by the law. Until the remedy comes. And then the third, schoolmaster to lead us to the one with the remedy. This is the purpose of the law. Diagnose, protect, hedge, while the, while, waiting for the remedy, and lead us to the one with the remedy. These are the purposes the law was given. Any other purpose? Is there any other purpose? Maybe I haven't thought of them. Any other purpose? Any other functional application of the written law? I don't want to miss something, but, but any purpose that, 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 that plays besides diagnosing, protecting, and leading us to Christ... Any other purpose in salvation is not true. There's no legal mechanism for salvation. There is restorative and recreating mechanisms. So, I think I'll skip those quotes and we'll move on. There's a couple interesting quotes about if if man had kept the law of... In fact, I'll read one of them. Patriarchs and Prophets 364. If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham, there would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant of which circumcision was a sign, notice circumcision is a sign, it's not the covenant, they would have never been seduced into idolatry, nor would have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. They would have kept God's law in mind, and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved upon the tablets of stone. And if the people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need for the additional directions given to Moses. Why do you keep giving additional directions? Because we're not getting it. Because we're not getting it. This is not an act of an authoritarian God implementing a judicial government with rules and enforcement. This is a a loving God implementing structure for for immature people out of control and bent on self-destruction to try and protect. Do you guys hear pressure 
practicing the principles of the Ten Commandments the same as obeying the Ten Commandments. Do you hear those the same? So, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that. Um, what do you think about the uh, this paragraph, the last paragraph, it says in, in Tuesday's lesson, while the ceremonial law points to, this, to the Messiah and emphasized holiness and the need of a savior, it is the moral law with its thou shalt not that reveals sin that shows us that sin is not just a part of our natural but is indeed a violation of God's law. This is why Paul says where there's no law, there's no trans. What are they trying to say? Sin is not merely a part of our condition. It's a violation of God's law. Are they trying to separate but is indeed involved? There's no transgression. Maybe trying to lead us to think about the do's and the don'ts. Am I missing it? Hmm. Maybe I'm projecting onto it. Um, but if it's not sin until we behaviorally act on it, then what do you make of Romans 7.7? 7? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law, for I would not have known that coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. What is the sin of the 10th commandment? What behavior is that? What deed do you carry out for that one? What, ba what action do you take to, to, to break that one? What action? What behavior? C can we look at somebody to know whether they're covering or not, coveting or not? <laughs> no. The point, this is the point Paul makes. If you read Paul's writings, Paul was a Pharisee. And he was a Pharisee who kept the rules. And he kept them all. And he didn't know, and he didn't even believe that he was a sinner until he was convicted on the 10th. And it was the 10th that made him realize it's not about behavior at all. It's about the motive in the heart and the condition of the heart that, that leads to the behavior. And so thus, we can have people who are very self-absorbed, narcissistic, self-centered, and they aggrandize themselves with huge displays of, of outlandish clothing or heavy makeup and jewelry and stuff. And, and those people will often get condemned in church organizations for bringing attention to self because there's a Bible verse that says that, that you should not adorn yourself like this. You should be, you know, you know somewhat of the beauty of a character, right? But we miss the person on the other end who is so plain and so, um, uh, uh, let's shall we say, 19th century in their dress that, that they are the, the proudest of their most humble approach to things. And they're going to be the plainest, most unadorned, most unattractive human being that walks the planet of the earth. And they're going to feel so proud of how humble and unattractive they are. And it's the same narcissism. It's just a different behavior. Same self-centered self-promotion. Just different behavior. If behaviors are the problem, it also contradicts what Christ said on the Sermon on the Mount. That's right. That's exactly right. So back to what I think Wendell was saying earlier. I really like what I think the commandments are actually saying. When you trust me, I will heal you, and you will not have other gods. You shall not do these things, because you will have a new heart and right spirit, and I'll write my law on your heart and mine. This is a promise of our regeneration transformation, not a list of things. And imagine back in the tuberculosis hospital, if you saw that list on the wall, all the healthy will not do these, will not cough, will not fear. And so the doctor comes around to examine you, and you want to be one of the healthy really bad, so when he comes around, you just suck on some ice chips before they take your temperature to make sure you, that the thermometer won't go up. And, and you work, mm, I'm not going to cough, mm, I'm not going to cough, mm, and you're working really hard not to cough, and you're trying to hide all your symptoms from the doctor. Does that make any sense to anybody? That's modern Christianity. When the Father comes to look at us, we're going to try to do everything we can to hide everything that's wrong with us. Oh, look at the Son who stands between me and you. Let's apply the blood who covers me. I heard this week on Christian radio here in Chattanooga that when you accept Jesus, his blood covers you. So when the Father looks at you, he can't see you. He sees the blood of his Son. On Christian radio, one, Tuesday, Wednesday morning, driving into work. <laughs> what, what are we saying this stuff? Well, what would the Father do if he saw it? Well, on the false law model, he'd have to punish under our model, he's your doctor. If he sees it, he's going to fix it. 
If you let him, if you trust him, he'll find what's wrong and he'll fix it. He'll heal you. So when the doctor comes in, if you really love and trust your doctor and you know he's got a remedy, you say, hey, doc, I've got this pain here. I've been coughing up blood. I was miserable. I was nauseated, vomit. I know I made a terrible mess, doc, but I want to get well. Will you, will, you, will you heal me? This is the approach. So I'm going to keep jumping ahead here. Some really, really interesting quotes we won't have time for today. We'll go into Wednesday's lesson. Discuss the question at the top of the lesson. Does Paul's statement about the law being added at Mount Sinai mean that it did not exist previously? If not, what was the difference before and after Mount Sinai? And so here's Paul writing to Timothy. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. This is 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. We also know that the law is not made for the righteous. Notice the law, the written law, the commandments were not written down for righteous people, but for lawbreakers and the rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and the irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, or for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that comes from the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he has entrusted to me. The MRI was not made for healthy people. It was made for the sick, for the diseased, for the infirmed, for those that have brokenness. It wasn't made for the healthy. That's what it was made for. For those of you still having problems with this idea, and I, I, I like to give lots of evidences, I just remind you about the idea of what the Ten Commandments are. Think about Newton's laws of motion. Isaac Newton's laws of motion. First law, an object at rest remains at rest and an object of motion continues at a constant velocity unless acted upon by an external force. That's his first law of motion. There's several laws of motion. I won't read the rest of them. But when you think about these laws of motion, I want you to answer the following questions. Are they real? Or are they made up, just imaginary? Real or imaginary? Real. Do they apply to our lives? Or do they not apply to our lives? Do they apply to everyone or only those who hear about them and choose to believe in them? Are they rules we must obey or descriptions of how reality functions? When did they go into effect? If Newton had not written them down on paper, would that mean these laws do not exist and would not be in effect? If we decide in church committee that the wording of the first law should read this way. An object at rest remains at rest until it receives permission from the proper church committee to move. <laughs> Does anything actually happen in reality? In other words, can human beings change God's laws? What would it mean then, think about it, what would it mean then if church committees did start trying to pass laws like that? that they don't see God's laws as design laws. They see them as imposed rules. And that's exactly what the church has done historically is they voted to change the commandments because they see them simply as imposed rules, not design law. The Ten Commandments are like Newton's laws. They were not in existence in this written form before Sinai. God wrote them down for a specific species of people at a specific time in human history with a specific need to understand these things. But they are based on the eternal principles that were always in operation from the very beginning because they originate in the character and nature of God. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think the strongest objection is even within our church without the law just because their perception of the Sabbath. Yes. And so in trying to uphold the Sabbath, they have tried to generate ideologies that will make it so that it cannot be changed. So I'm going to read one quick quote and then one from, this is from um, Thoughts of Mount of Blessing 123 and then one really cool thing from the lesson. Um, the effort to earn salvation by one's own works inevitably leads men to pile up human exact exactions that is a barrier against sin. For seeing that they fail to keep the law, they will devise rules and regulations of their own to force themselves to obey. All this turns the minds away from God to self. Sabbath rules, Sabbath regulations, what we're talking about here. His love dies out of the heart. 
And with it perishes love for his fellow men. A system of human invention with its multitude, uh, multitudinous exactions will lead its advocates to judge all who come short of the prescribed human standard. The atmosphere of selfish, the atmosphere of selfish and narrow criticism stifles the noble and generous emotions and causes men to become self-centered judges and petty spies. Pharisees were of this class, blah, blah, blah. The people partook largely of the same spirit in intruding upon the province of conscience and judging one another in matters that lay between the soul and God. It was in reference to this spirit and practice that Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. That is, do not set yourselves up as a standard. Do not make your opinions, your views of duty, your interpretations of scripture a criterion for others and in your heart condemn them if they do not come up to your ideal. Wow, and I'm going to tell you, that is rife within certain groups, particularly with how people should keep the Sabbath and what behaviors are okay and not okay to do on the Sabbath. This is a matter of the conscience. Paul in Fort, Romans 14 says, some observe, think this day is, is, is sacred and some that day. Let every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. We are not to come between the soul and God. Okay, and then the quote I'm going to close with out of the lesson, I thought it was very well done. It's in Wednesday's lesson and it says, quote, Christ can do what the law could never do, provide a true remedy for sin. Amen. <laughs> yes, that's, that's well said. Okay. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have, through Jesus Christ, provided the true remedy that can fix and heal what we could never do, no matter how hard we worked. And we still, no matter how hard we work, cannot remedy this condition. But we don't have to, because you've already procured the remedy. We ask now that your spirit will come. Take what you've achieved and reproduce it in us. So it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. Give us new heart, new motives, new desires, new insight, new wisdom, new perspective. Empower us to go out and share this message, truth in love, leaving others free. We pray in your holy name. Amen.